ไปวิสิตไม่รู้ว่าคุณเป็นยังไงแต่ฉันชอบร้องเพลงเกี่ยวกับว่าโอ้โหพระเจ้าเป็นเท่าไหร่ไม่มีใครเท่าพระเจ้าเลยที่นี่ในที่นี้พวกเราจะเรียนให้ลูกๆไปเรียนเพลงเกี่ยวกับการเจริญเพราะพวกเราจะมีเด็กๆที่เป็นผู้ปกครองอาจารย์อยู่ในหน้าต่างขอบคุณขอบคุณทุกคนที่ช่วยกันทำให้เราเริ่มต้นวันอาทิตย์ใหม่ขึ้นมาเรามีเด็กที่ทำงานในห้องเรียนและพวกเราเดินขึ้นไปในเวลาขอบคุณขอบคุณทุกคนที่ช่วยกันทำให้เราเริ่มต้นวันอาทิตย์ใหม่ขึ้นมาเรามีเด็กที่ทำงานในห้องเรียนและพวกเราเดินขึ้นไปในเวลาขอบคุณขอบคุณทุกคนที่ช่วยกันทำให้เราเริ่มต้นวันอาทิตย์ใหม่ขึ้นมาเรามีเด็กที่ทำงานในห้องเรียนและพวกเราเดินขึ้นไปในเวลาขอบคุณขอบคุณทุกคนที่ช่วยกันทำให้เราเริ่มต้นวันอาทิตย์ใหม่ขึ้นมาเรามี Um, also online, simply so that we're all on the same page together. If you didn't get the email, one of the things that is sort of dictating our calendar here is the fact that my wife is due in a couple of weeks here. Okay, and so my thought has been, well, let's try to get everything done before the end of the month because we should be safe. Okay, which means we have a bunch of things happening, especially next weekend, that I want to make sure we're all on the same page for. Okay, so next week, the sun, the 23rd, at 9:30 in our Sunday school hour, I'm going to actually uh, commandeer that time. We're going to jump out and we're going to talk a little bit about the SBC. There's a lot of things the SBC does wonderfully. There are a lot of excellent servants, but just like any other organization, there are things that pop up from time to time, and you need to talk about them and you need to address them. And so we'll talk about some of those in our Sunday school hour. We'll have a regular church service that comes up then, and then after, we're going to have a potluck meal. Okay. Now, sometimes when we've done pot potluck meals here, what that looks like is, you come and we feed you. Okay. We're not doing it that way. This time is, you come with the food and we share it. And if we don't bring the food to share, guess what? I think we have some crackers, or we'll be eating the communion wafers. Okay. Um, so we will be eating. What we bring, okay? The church will provide some drinks, um, but we're asking you to bring some sort of entree-type meal to share with folks, and then a side or a dessert as well. Because whatever we bring is what we eat, and if we don't bring it, we just won't eat. Okay? So maybe we'll go fasting next Sunday, but we'll see. But I encourage you to come. Hopefully, it won't be 90 degrees. So hopefully, it'll be warm enough, cool enough. That is, that if you want to eat outside, if you might be comfortable with that, you're welcome to do that. I'm planning to bring my little pop-up tent thing. If you have one, you're welcome to bring it. Folks might want to eat outside if they're not comfortable inside, but it'll give us a chance to fellowship a before it gets a bazillion degrees, and b before we have a new baby in our house. So that is Sunday, and then on Monday, we are hosting the uh, the pregnancy support center here in Salisbury. They've done one of these before in town, a diaper drive-through, where those who have small children, those who can benefit from receiving diapers because they are paper gold, if you have a child, um, is an opportunity for us to give to those who are in need. And so we've already have some folks who have dropped off some diapers to be collected. If you would like to bring some, there's a spot in the fellowship hall to do that. But on Monday evening, we are hosting them. We're going to have them come here. We're going to set up some tables, and we'll have folks come drive through to pick up some diapers, and we'll get a chance to talk with them, pray with them if they would like us to do that. And so we can use some volunteers if you would like to help with that. There's a sign-up sheet out there. We would enjoy having you be a part of it. And then just lastly, as you make your summer plans here, be in mind that uh, VBS we're doing a little differently. We're doing it on Saturday. We're doing a one-day VBS in the morning to early afternoon. If you're able to help, please sign up. You can see the date and the time there in your bulletin. Okay. So I hate starting with announcements, but it gives us a chance to sort of make sure we're all on the same page. We all know what's happening um, over this next uh, week and a couple days here. Let's pray, shall we? Lord, I thank you for what you have given us in Christ. Lord, I thank you that you called us, and as we talked about in Sunday school, you are building us up together to this holy group. Lord, thank you. We get a chance to um, experience that and enjoy that this coming Sunday. Lord, thank you that in your love for us, we then get a chance to demonstrate that love for others, and we'll get a chance to do that on Monday. Thank you, Lord. But Lord, we do these things for you. Lord, we recognize that how great Thou art. 
You are an amazing God, a powerful God. So powerful, in fact, that with your voice you were able to create and you are able to sustain everything that we know. Lord, the more scientists, every so often you see they discover something new, Lord, and that new discovery is not new to you. You made it. You know it more intimately than any of us could. And yet, Lord, you loved us. You sent Christ to be the propitiation, the sacrifice, the substitute for our sin. Oh, Lord, thank you. We do not deserve such a gracious gift. And so, Lord, today we fall down in awe of you. We lift up our songs in awe of you. We open up our word to hear from you, the ancient of days, the holy God. Lord, I pray that your spirit would work in us today as we are in your word, that we would not hear my words but that we would hear yours. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. If you noticed this morning, and if you flip through your bulletin, we're not in Jeremiah today. You might be like, well, I thought we were going through Jeremiah. We are. <laughs> we will get back to Jeremiah, okay? But I wanted to, for this week and two more, step out a little bit and talk together. You see, over the last six to nine months, I've been doing what you might describe as like vision, mission, purpose, thinking in the time that I have. You know, you try to think through some of these things. And I want to sort of walk us together as a congregation through some of the thinking I've already done and the praying and what the Lord has laid my heart on so that we all together can be thinking these ways. One of the questions, is you, if you know, if you listen to any of my sermons or Sunday school, you know I like to ask questions, right? You're like, oh, he's going to do it again, right? One of the great questions when you're thinking through this sort of stuff is this. What are you doing and why are you doing it? Right? As a church, that's a really important question. Like, what are we doing? Why are we doing it? Do we have an answer? Are we just doing it because it's what we did before COVID? <laughs> are we just doing it because it's what your mom and your dad did with you? What are we doing and why are we doing it? Those are very important questions that we should have an answer to. We really need to have one. I was seeing, I saw and read a story about this guy who was out on the beach and heard a bunch of screaming and commotion and realized a bunch of folks had been swept out in the waves and he is a military guy. He rushed out there. He's swimming. He did three or four trips back and forth. There was a couple other folks who were out there. They were going out. They were saving these folks who had been stuck out with a rip current and were floundering out there trying just to stay alive. If it wasn't for some of these brave men who went out there, they would not have made it. Our world is like a rip current. It's pulling us away from God, and if we don't have a good answer to the question, what are we doing and why are we doing it, we're like those folks stuck out in the rip current just sort of flailing around. <laughs> That's not a good place to be. <laughs> so how do we answer this question? How do we think through these things? How do we come up with the answer to what are we doing and why are we doing it? Over these next three weeks, I'd like us to talk through some of these things. We're going to start today by asking ourselves another question, the question for a question, right? So that's how you're supposed to teach if you're teaching. Someone asks, you know, a kid asks, what's the, give them a question, they answer with a question, you give them back a question, right? It's a way to understand, a way to think, a way to process things. What are we doing and why? Well, where's a good place to start? Why don't we start by asking ourselves, well, what motivates God? After all, if something motivates him to action, perhaps it should motivate us to action. If something is important to God, perhaps it should be important to us, right? If we can discern why God acts, why he does what he does, perhaps it might direct us to decide what we should be doing as well. Where do we find the answers? Are we going to sit here and wait that the, hope the sky opens up and an angelic messenger comes down? 
We have God's Word. We have the Spirit. And so I want to begin this week and the next to sharing with you some of the things the Lord has laid on my heart so that we can think together and so that when we ask ourselves the question, what are we doing and why are we doing it? We don't just sit there and go, I don't know. Because <laughs> um, my friends are there. Let's think through this. So we're going to, today, we're going to look at one sentence, one Greek sentence, okay? Now, don't get your hopes up too high, okay? This is the longest sentence in the New Testament. (laughs) In fact, in our Bibles, if you have any translation, most likely they have broken it up into multiple sentences, but in the Greek, it is one (laughs) sentence. Paul just goes on and 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 on. If you've ever written a paper, perhaps you're like that. You have run on sentences that just keep going, okay? That's, this is what this is. Ephesians 1, 3 through 14. Fun sentence. There's lots of different ways we could jump into here to study it. In fact, if you go online and you look at how folks have preached through this text, most of the time you see it takes weeks to get through verses 3 through 14. And we're going to try to do it in 30 minutes, <laughs> There are lots of different things we could talk about. You see the Trinity function, you see the great blessings of God, and we'll talk about some of those things. But I want to use this text and work through this text because I believe in this text we get to see God's heart a little bit. More specifically, we get to see why God does what God does. In other words, his motivation. Why does God do what God does? Well, I think this text tells us that. So we're going to work through it, and we're going to see if we can answer that question this morning. Now, in your notes, you might have noticed that text looks really funny. It's like, what is Pastor Stephen doing there? Maybe he just had like a chicken run across his keyboard as he put that in. Okay. This is a very uh, unscientific, non-seminarian block diagram (laughs) for all of you. It's a way that our eyes can sort of see how the structure of the sentence is com- connecting to each other. And again, this is if you were actually going to do a full block diagram, you would see it starts up here and the sentence just keeps going and going and going. The indentations tell us that this is a supporting idea. It supports the thing that's to the left that's either in front of it or below it. So let's read through our text here, Ephesians chapter 1, verses 3 through 14. Blessed is the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly realms in Christ. For he chose us in Christ before the foundation of the world, that we may be holy and unblemished in his sight in love. He did this by predestinating us to adoption as his sons through Jesus Christ, according to the pleasure of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace that he has freely bestowed on us in his dearly loved Son." In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace that he lavished on us in all wisdom and insight. He did this when he revealed to us the secret of his will according to his good pleasure that he set forth in Christ. Towards the administration of the fullness of times to head up all things in Christ, the things in heaven and the things on earth. In Christ we too have been claimed as God's own possession since we were predestined according to the one purpose of him who accomplishes all things according to the counsel of his will, so that we, who were the first to set our hope on Christ, would be to the praise of his glory. And when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, when you believed in Christ, you were marked with the seal of the promised Holy Spirit, who is the down payment of our inheritance until the redemption of God's own possession to the praise of his glory. Our text begins with what we might describe as sort of an introductory thought. Verse 3, we can sort of say this is a nutshell of what's happening here. We see that ultimately the text tells us that God is worthy to be praised for all he has done, right? He starts out, blessed is the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed is the idea of praising God, honoring God, telling God how great he is a theme that was frequently used in the Psalms. And he starts out, blessed is the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. So God is blessed, and then he says, who, so this is God here, so God has 
blessed us. So he says, God is blessed because he has blessed us. He has turned around and been gracious to us. In other words, God is worthy to be praised for all he has done for us. And then Paul is going to start unpacking this. Again, going on and on and on, and all these wonderful truths. We're going to look at four of these blessings quickly here. Our text in verses 4 through 5 remind us that in Christ we are chosen and we are adopted, right? We see those words. He chose us in Christ. He says that we may be holy and unblemished. So he says, you are my children. I will transform you. Last week on Mother's Day, we talked about the encouragement we find that God doesn't just leave us in our sin. He will work in us. He will shape us. We see that promise here. It says he predestines us to adoption in verse 5. Adoption is amazing. Those who have no family because of loss are brought into a family. They're given all the rights of the family they are brought into. And Paul says, when we are in Christ, we are adopted. We are the sons and daughters of the Most High God, the beneficiary and the recipient of everything. We also see in verses 7 through 8 that in Christ we are redeemed and we are forgiven. We talked about forgiveness last week, right? In him we have redemption. The idea there is our sin, the burden on it. He has freed us from that. In Christ we have redemption through his blood. Now, sort of as a quick aside here, sometimes when we see the word blood, we see this sort of concept, we sing about it in some of our hymns. Sometimes we can have the notion that what saves us is the physical blood of Jesus Christ, okay? When things like that are mentioned in the text, they're a reference and a picture of the Old Testament. In the book of Leviticus, we're told that the life of the flesh is in the blood, meaning when you have no blood, you're dead. (laughs) When the blood was poured out of the sacrifices, it killed the sacrifice. And so when he says here, in him we have redemption through his blood, it doesn't mean that when they put the nails through his arm and his blood was splattered, that splattering blood is what saved us. No. That blood coming out signified his death for us. In him we have the redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses. Interesting pay words. Our trespasses, when we go against, when we go into that place, when we do those things we're not supposed to do. It's like when you're at the airport and it says employees only, you're like, can I go in there? That looks interesting, right? We have trespassed against God. He has told us what we are to do and not to do, and we have violated that. He says, I will forgive you of that, according to this grace that he gives us in wisdom and insight, our wise, loving, all-powerful God. He says, this is what I'm going to do for you. We also see that in Christ We are God's possession. Verse 11, right? In Christ, we too have been claimed as God's own possession. Now, at first, we might be tempted to go, hold on, I'd like my independence, please. (laughs) I don't want to be his. Perhaps we might even dare to think of the concept of like a trophy wife. You know, you're all familiar with that, right? Some rich old dude marries a really young lady because he's so rich. This is my trophy wife. He's like, are we God's trophies? Yes, (laughs) you are. And that's a good thing. It means he loves you. It means he wants to know you. He wants to adopt you, and he's not like, oh, man, Pastor Stephen, do I have to? He's like, no, I want you. Come here. It gives us that comfort, that security, that hope. Being God's possession is not something that we should bristle at. It's something we should rejoice in. In Christ, we are God's possession, something he values. I've got little kids, and they have these little boxes that they like to stick their little stuff in. It's so precious. Most of it needs to go in the trash can, right? But it's so precious. When they have those precious things, you keep them so safe unless you're three, and at that point, you just destroy them because you have no idea what you're doing, right? But if you have something that is precious to you as grown-ups, we probably keep it very safe, right? Maybe you have a safe for your valuables. Here we see that we are God's possession. He loves us. He holds us safely, and we should rejoice in that. 
So in Christ, we are chosen, adopted, we are redeemed, we're forgiven, we're God's possession. And even on top of all of that, he says, we've been sealed with the Holy Spirit. We've been sealed with the Holy Spirit. Verse 13, and when you heard the words of truth, when you believed in Christ, you were marked with the seal of the promised Holy Spirit. Have you ever bought a car that you made payments on or you bought a house? You know how this works, right? I will buy this item, this house, this car, hopefully not things like TVs. Those are not good investments to put down payments on. I will buy this house. I don't have the bazillion dollars. Everything costs a bazillion dollars now, right? I, I don't have all of it, but I'll put a down payment down. It's a promise that I will make the payments every month. The Holy Spirit is that down payment. God says, I will give you eternity. I will bring you with me for all eternity. And right now, the down payment of that is the Holy Spirit who lives in you. That's why when we feel the conviction of the Spirit, we should rejoice. When we are bothered by our sin, we should celebrate it because that means that God is working in us and we are his children and we have the down payment, which means we have heaven before us. Christ, we have so many wonderful blessings, Paul says. That's why you can say, blessed is the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly realms in Christ. He has chosen us. He has adopted us. He has redeemed us. He has forgiven us. We are his possessions, and he has given us the Spirit as a down payment of what we have. So now that we at least understand in this text, at least in a basic level, let's go back to our question, right? What motivates God? Does this text help us? Yes, it does. Where do we begin? Well, I'd like us to begin by reminding ourselves that God acts according to his will. God acts according to his will. Look at verse 5, right? He did this by predestinating us to adoption as his sons through Jesus Christ according to the pleasure of his will. Verse 9, he did this when he revealed to us the secret of his will. The end of verse 11, according to the counsel of his will. God does what he wants— and he is able to do what he wants. He has a divine will that lays out the plan, and he acts on it. In verses 9 through 11, he tells us that this will is to work through Jesus Christ, to head everything up in Christ. His plan, as Paul talks about in other places, is the mystery that we who are once far off are now brought close by the blood of Jesus Christ, that those of us who are Gentiles, who were not recipients of the promises of Abraham, now have become sons and daughters of Abraham through Jesus Christ. That's God's will. That's his plan. He acts according to it, and because he's God, nothing will thwart that plan. God does what he does because he wants to do it. And he is able to do it, and nothing can stop him from it. Now, not only does God act according to his will, but our text also tells us that when he does this, it brings him delight and pleasure. When God does what God wants to do, because he has the right to do it, because he's the one who made us, when God does what he wants to do, when he does it, it brings him delight and it brings him pleasure. Back to verse 5, right? He did this by predestining us to adoption as his sons through Jesus Christ. Notice the phrase, according to the pleasure of his will. If you ever go to Chick-fil-A, they, um, hey, thank you. And what are the, what's the response they give you at Chick-fil-A, right? You guys have never been to Chick-fil-A. Wow. What do they say at Chick-fil-A? It's my pleasure, right? Something that, no, this brings me joy to do this. When God acts according to his will, it brings him pleasure. Verse 9, he did this when he revealed to us the secret of his will according to his good pleasure that he set forth in Christ. We might have things that we enjoy. Perhaps you enjoy woodworking. Perhaps you enjoy shooting out at the range. Perhaps you enjoy reading a book or sewing a dress. Perhaps you enjoy baking, working in the garden. God says, you know what I enjoy? I enjoy doing what I want to do. 
I enjoy carrying out my will to do everything through Jesus Christ. When God does what he wants to do, it brings him delight. Okay? Well, is there anything in particular that brings him delight? What delight does he get from redeeming us through Jesus Christ? What does he get? What tickles his funny bone, so to speak, when he redeems us, he forgives us, he adopts us? What brings him such great delight? Well, I think our text tells us this. God's motivation in accomplishing his will is the praise of his glory. You can say it this way. In everything he does, God is motivated by exalting himself. He is motivated, he enjoys it, he gets delight when he becomes glorious. Let me show you where I think our text speaks these things. Look at verse 5 and 6, okay? So he did this. So the idea of choosing us, all of those things, right? He did this by predestining us to adoption as his sons through Jesus Christ, according to the pleasure of his will, right? Verse 6 to the praise of the glory of his grace. He wants the world to know how great his grace is. He wants the world to see how awesome he is. And so he did this. He predestined us to adoption. Verses 11 and 12. In Christ, we've been claimed as God's own possession since we were predestined according to the one purpose of him who accomplished all things according to the counsel of his will. Why did he do that? Why did he do these things? So that we were the first to set our hope on Christ, so that we would be to the praise of his glory. God did these things for us so that he would look good. God chose to save us in Christ, not because he necessarily had pity, although he did. God chose to act through Jesus Christ to make himself look good to exalt himself, to glorify himself, to show the world, to show us how great of a God he is. Our God is good. He's adopted us, redeemed us, forgiven us, right? That list of things we talked through, he did all of those things. Why? So we would see how great he is. (laughs) Verses 13 and 14, right? When you heard the word of truth, he says you were marked. Verse 14, You're marked with the Holy Spirit, verse 14, who is the down payment of our inheritance until the redemption of God's own possession. Okay, great. Notice the last phrase, right? (laughs) To the praise of his glory. God did all of these things to the praise of his glory. In everything God did, he is motivated by exalting himself, by making himself look good. Isaiah 42, 8. I am the Lord, that is my name. I will not share my glory with anyone else or the praise do me with idols. God says, me first, my glory, my honor, my praise. And we as human beings say, that's a little selfish, God. (laughs) That sounds a little selfish of you to think that way. God, you did this for you? I mean, come on, God. I I teach my children it's not about you. Who indeed are you, a mere human being, to talk back to God? Does what is molded say to the molder, Why have you made me like this? Romans 9, 20. Because God is God, the supreme creator of all, the ancient of days, who stands before time, holy God, blessed Trinity, because he is so amazing and so awesome, not only is it okay, a for him to desire his exaltation. It is in fact good, holy, and right for him to do this. There is no one else that God can say, yeah, you need to go give that person praise. He can't do that. You know, there's that expression, right? The top of the totem pole, right? At work. Oh, he's at the top of the totem pole. The most important person. There's nowhere else to go. There's no one else to praise. There's no one else to give honor to except for the guy on the top of the totem pole expression, right? That's God. There is no one else God can say, oh, give that person glory instead. 
In fact, it would be idolatrous for God to say, okay, have my glory, here's my glory, I'm so awesome, let me give it to someone else. That would be idolatrous of God. Um, I got a letter every so often, now they seem to be doing this thing where Jehovah's Witnesses mail letters out to folks. I don't know, maybe you've gotten some. My wife's gotten like four, I've gotten two now. Um, I just don't have the time, but I'd love to respond. And one of the things I would love to share with them is this question. If God will not give his glory out to anyone, why does he exalt Christ? Why does he want to see him and everything underneath him that seems like he's giving up his glory? The answer is, is Jesus is divine. Jesus is not an angel. He is divine, and therefore he is worthy of glory and honor. And when God does these things through Christ, God is not giving his glory and honor to someone else. Because we have one God in three persons, and as the hymn writer says, blessed trinity. We see here in Ephesians chapter 1 that God has a will. He does everything through Jesus Christ. He has redeemed us. He has forgiven us. He has adopted us. He has called us his possessions. He has said, hey, I'll give you my spirit. He does all of these things. Why does he do it? Because it exalts him. Because it makes him look good. Let me read some other passages to you here. Romans 11, verses 33 through 36. Oh, the depth of the riches and wisdom and knowledge of God, how unsearchable are his judgments, how unfathomable his ways. For who has known the mind of the Lord, or who has been his counselor? Who has first given to God that God needs to repay him? For from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be glory forever. Amen. Ephesians 2, 6 through 7. He raised us up together with him and seated us together with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus. Why? To demonstrate in the coming ages the surpassing wealth of his grace in kindness towards us in Jesus Christ. He says, I want myself to look good. Ephesians three twenty one. To him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. 1 Peter 4.11, whoever speaks, let it be with God's words. Whoever serves, do so with the strength that God supplies, so that in everything God will be glorified through Jesus Christ. To him belong the glory and the power forever and ever. Amen. Even in our Sunday school, another reference, 1 Peter 2.9, we could have put in here, right? He saved us so that we can do What? Share the virtues of the one who saved us. Tell the world how great he is. Revelations 4, 9 through 11. Whenever the living creatures give glory and honor and thanks to the one who sits on the throne, who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders throw themselves to the ground before the one who sits on the throne and worship the one who lives forever and ever, and they offer their crowns before his throne, saying, You are worthy, our Lord and God, to receive glory and glory and honor and power since you created all things. And because of your will, they existed and were created. Revelation 5, 13 through 14. Then I heard every creature in heaven, on earth, and under the earth, in the sea, and all that is in them saying, to the one seated on the throne and to the Lamb, be praise, honor, glory, and power forever and ever. And the four living creatures were saying amen, and the elders threw themselves to the ground and worshipped. We see in Ephesians 1 that God acts according to his will. He did everything in Christ. He adopted us. He forgave us. He claims us as his possession. Why? To please himself by exalting himself. So that everyone would know how great he is. If God chose to create us like the deists believe, start up the clock and let it run, we would never know how great he is. But through Christ, we're able to see his mercy, his justice, his love, his compassion, his anger. We are disabled to see how great our God is. Why does God act? He acts to exalt himself. So what do we do with this? Well, if you do not know Jesus Christ as your Savior, first of all, I need to warn you. God is glorified when his children come and we 
repent and he saves us. But God is also glorified when he takes those who are destined for destruction, those who refuse to believe, and he says, now I will pour out my righteous anger and judgment on you. God, because he is a great God, cannot overlook sin. That's why those who are saved in Jesus Christ, it's not like God looks at me and says, hey, I'm just going to overlook it. He doesn't do that. Instead, he looks at my bill of sin and he says, Jesus will pay it in full. He doesn't just ignore, he doesn't just erase it off the whiteboard. He says, I must pay it, and he did it in Jesus Christ. If you do not know Jesus as your Savior, you will pay the penalty of your sin, and God will be glorified in your destruction. But there is salvation if you will, by faith, repent. If you will turn to the blessings He offers forgiveness. He offers redemption. He offers adoption to those who will call upon the name of the Lord. So if you do not know Christ as your Savior, I encourage you to turn to him. What about those of us who are saved? What do we do? Okay, I understand what God operates, what motivates him. What does that mean for me? There's a text in your note page, right? 1 Corinthians 6. Let's look at that, shall we? Do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, and you are not your own? You were bought at a price, right? Jesus Christ, his blood, suffering, dying, in order to give us those blessings, in order to forgive us, redeem us, adopt us, choose us. He had to die on the cross and suffer. So, so we have been bought at a price. Notice what he says next. Therefore glorify God with your body. Therefore, make your life not about you, but about God and his glory and God's exaltation. 1 Corinthians 10.31 says the same thing. He says, whether you eat or drink, whatever you do, right? That's pretty broad. (laughs) Whatever you do, what does he say? Do everything for the glory of God. Christians, in everything God does, he is motivated to exalt himself, in order to bring praise and glory to himself. As individuals here today, is that our motivation? Is God's motivation our motivation? Do you function day to day when you wake up in the morning? Do you say, what is important to me? What motivates me to do X, Y, or Z? Is it the answer to show the world how good God is, to exalt God, to glorify God. Is that your motivation? It's God's. If it's God's motivation, it's probably pretty important for us. Is our delight in his pleasure as individuals, as married couples, as families? Do we function and are we motivated for God? Or do we say, well, everything I do, I do because I like it, because I'm important. (laughs) We're just the pot. (laughs) What rights do we have? When we think that way, when we say, that sounds like God is selfish, do we really have to do that? The answer is, that's just your idolatry. Thinking we have the right to do what we want to do is nothing more than pride and idolatry. Pride that says, God, I know you created the world. I know you sent Jesus to die for my sins. I know the angels, you created all of them. They'll bow down and worship you. But today, God, I'm more important than you. (laughs) Today, God, my glory is more important than your glory. Oh, man. (laughs) Now, most of us, if we know Christ as our Savior, I would never say that. I would never think that. But can we not operate that way? Can we not be motivated that way? That what matters to us is us. It's idolatry when we worship ourselves. (laughs) Probably, maybe you've had a child like this, or you've seen a child like this. Maybe you've seen a child like this at Walmart. Mom or dad says this, and the child goes, No! (laughs) Not doing that! (laughs) You can't have this toy. So they pick it up and throw it in the cart. No, you can't have this. They throw it in the cart. 
Perhaps they're going through the checkout lane, right? All the wonderful chocolate and candies are on the side. Mom, I want this. And they start pulling it off. No, you can't have that. They keep fighting mom. No, 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 no. We're sort of like embarrassed for them, right? I don't, I don't want that. Hopefully it's not your child. Like, oh, that's my child. Like, oh, what do I do? My wife's seen a lady who was in that predicament, and she made a great choice. She said, okay. She just said, sorry. She left the cart, and they went home. She's like, I can't deal with this. We have to deal with it at home. We look at a child who stomps their feet at their parents, slams things around, who says, my way, no. And we say, that is an insolent, selfish, bratty little kid. When we tell God that we're important, we are like that little child. (laughs) That is us. How prideful of us. We need to be like John the Baptist, right? What did John the Baptist say? He must increase, and I must decrease. Are we as individuals motivated by what motivates God? How about us corporately, as a church? We talked about at the beginning the mission, vision, these sort of things as a church. As we think through these things, as we try to decide, okay, God, what do we do and why do we do it? The answer to the why question is actually pretty simple. (laughs) Everything we do should be for God's glory and exaltation. Do you know what that means? That means church isn't about me, and church isn't about you. And church isn't about what you like. And church isn't about your friends. And church isn't about your family. And church isn't about the songs that we sing. And church isn't about the children's programs that we have. And church is not about Sunday school. And church is not about Wednesday night. Church is not about any of those things. Church is about God. Church is about God's glory and exaltation. I want to ask a scary scary question to you and think about this in your head. Why are you here this morning? Why are you here? Do you have an answer to that question? (laughs) Do you actually have an answer? Sometimes, and I know this because I've been in those same shoes. Why are you here? I'm paid to be here. That's a terrible answer. Why are you here? Um, Because we're running this program. Well, that's a terrible answer. Why are you here? Well, my friends are either. That's a terrible answer. Why are we there? I love to hear and to study God's word. That's a terrible answer. Why are you here today? Is it because you want God to look good? Or are you here, um, as they have on airplanes, because of autopilot? Sunday morning, your alarm goes beep, beep, beep at a certain time. You get up, you take a shower, you eat some breakfast, you get dressed, you talk to your spouse, you get the kids ready. Hurry up, kids! You get in the car, you drive, and we're here at church. Why? Well, it's what we do on Sundays. So what's motivating you? I don't know. It's what we do on Sundays. That's a terrible, terrible, terrible motivation. As a church, we must be motivated by what motivates God. When we ask ourselves, why do we do X, Y, or Z, the answer ought to be not because it's fun because we like it, or we think it'll bring people into church, or because, hey, maybe my friends will come. Those aren't the answers. The answer ought to be, because it makes God look good. That ought to be our answer. And everything God does, he is motivated by exalting his glory, his fame, and his praise. And so as individuals, we need to ask ourselves, is that our motivation? And as a church, we need to ask ourselves that. Is God's motivation my motivation? What what does God do? Why does he operate to make himself look good? To the praise of his glory and honor, so that everyone would see how awesome he is. Is that why you do what you do? Is that why we do what we do? we do? Look back at verses 11 and 12. In Christ, we too have been claimed as God's own possession, since we were predestined according to the one purpose of him who accomplishes all things according to the counsel of his will. Why? So that we who were the first to set our hope on Christ 
would be to the praise of his glory. Is God's motivation our motivation? Why do we do what we do? (laughs) Why do you do what you do? Why are you here? (laughs) Is it because you want God to look good? Or is it because you're on autopilot? Or would you perhaps even dare, in the privacy of your heart, answer the question, I'm here because I want to be here for me? Oops. We would never want to say that, but is it not sometimes how we operate? We come to church, we do the church thing because of me. God says you have it backwards. God's glory, not our comfort, our encouragement, our joy, not our pleasure. God's glory. That's what motivated him to send Christ. That's what motivated him to forgive us, to adopt us, to redeem us, to claim us as his possession. Why? To make himself look good. If that's God's motivation, what is our motivation? Let us pray. Lord God, we have a wonderful text. So many deep truths, Lord. I wish we had days and days and days to pour through it. Perhaps one time we will. Lord, we see all the great blessings you have given us. Lord, as your children, you have adopted us. You have forgiven us of all our trespasses. You have chosen us. You have anointed us. You have prepared us for sanctification. You have given us the Holy Spirit as the down payment proving to us that we are your possessions. In our own pride and arrogancy, we might bristle at that thought. Oh God, why? I, I want to be myself. Oh Lord God, you are the great God, and we are nothing but broken vessels. Lord, we see in Ephesians 1 here that in everything you did, in your divine will through Jesus Christ, Lord, you did these things for your glory and honor. You did them so you would look good, so you would get the praise, so you would get the honor, so you would be glorified. Lord, forgive us. Lord, we are insolent children stomping our feet, declaring that the world revolves around us. Lord, we are arrogant, we are prideful, we are idolaters when we do that. Lord, I pray that from this day forward we would ask ourselves the question, why do I do what I do? Why do we act this way? And I pray the answer would be, Because God's motivation is his glory, and so now that's my motivation. I do what I do because my life is not my own. I've been bought with a price, so everything I do is about God. I act for his glory. We act for his praise. We do what we do because we want God to look good. Lord, may we all say both individually and corporately here, Lord, we must decrease and you must increase. Lord, you have given us so many blessings. You have bought us at such a great price. Blessed is the God and Savior, Jesus Christ. All glory is yours. Lord, you are worthy. Lord, may today you challenge our motivations. May you peer into our hearts as individuals. Lord, I pray that as we go home, the conversation between us and you through the Holy Spirit in our hearts might be this. Lord, why was I at church today? (laughs) Change my motivation. Lord, we must start here. Thank you, Lord, that you do everything for your glory. Thank you, Lord, that in your divine wisdom, Lord, you identified a great will, a great plan to do it, 
and that was to redeem us in Christ Jesus. O oh Lord God, how through Christ your glory is proclaimed. O oh Lord, through Christ your grace is known. Through Christ your compassion, your mercy, your forgiveness is known. It could have never been known apart from Christ. Thank you. To God be the glory, now and forevermore. We pray this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. We're going to finish here with a closing hymn. The title of this song is called Worthy God. It reminds us that God is worthy. You are worthy to receive honor, glory, power. You are worthy for everything. And it begs the question to us, are we motivated by what motivates God? <laughs> do we do what we do individually? Do we do what we do as a church because we want God to look good? Are we insolent children just doing it for ourselves? Let's stand and let us sing.